You attend the latest Impressionism exhibit. And while walking around, a Monet painting of a pond with some water lilies from 1899 gets your attention. So you decide to take a few moments and stop in front of it. Now comes the time to breathe in and try to interpret this famous painting. But where do you start? Maybe you could focus on its colors and shapes, on how it makes you feel, or on the materials used for creating it. You could also travel back to 19th century France and explore how this time frame relates to Monet's style. Likewise, you may think about the role that Monet had as an artist or on how being a man and not a woman influenced the recognition he obtained. One can't help but wonder if one of these alternatives is better than the other when interpreting an artwork. Actually, there's not a right or wrong way to decipher an artwork. These options are examples of the different types of questions we can ask an artwork depending on what we want to understand about it. The different ways of interpreting art from a formal, historical, emotional, or social lens are part of art history's theories and methods crafted during the last couple of centuries. While they have been around for quite some time, the ways of interpreting art are not static. They usually speak to each other and are continuously adapting to the new times and to the changes that art has had across centuries. It's definitely not the same to talk about a medieval altarpiece, a Monet painting like the one of the bridge and the pond, a Rothko painting, or a contemporary art installation. At the same time, frequently new interdisciplinary approaches borrowing from history, philosophy, conservation, and sociology, just to name a few disciplines that interact with art history, challenge the methods that were once widely followed and bring to the table important topics once left behind when talking about art, such as gender or race. The diversity of ways to approach art is also connected to the fact that art history is not an exact science. Quite the opposite is a discipline that relies on the time and place it was written and on the experiences of each viewer. One of the great things about art is that given its nature, it allows almost endless interpretations. That's why throughout history, there have been many theories attempting to define what art is without there being one definition accepted by all. At the same time, that is why there are hundreds or even thousands of books written on iconic artists such as Leonardo da Vinci, Monet, or Andy Warhol. And why, at this very minute, there's probably someone out there writing something new about them. So, what are the main features behind some of the methods that are followed to interpret art? Well, to begin with, let's talk about formalism, in which an artwork is asked, what do you look like? This approach considers all the shapes, colors, brush strokes, and lines that form part of an artwork individually and how they work with each other resulting in the layout or composition of an artwork. In our Monet painting of the bridge over the pond with water lilies, we would consider, for instance, the kinds of lines used to outline the bridge, the pond, the lilies, and the sky. The intensity and brightness of the colors used in the different sections of the painting. The types of shapes that are displayed. And the textures achieved by the thick brush strokes. The formalist approach gave birth to art criticism, a term that started being used as a category of writing about art in the early 18th century even if centuries before many authors have discussed art. At the same time, formalism is attached to a specific way of creating art during the 19th and 20th centuries. As an example of this interpretation of art, in 1804, French literateur Benjamin Constant famously said, La pour l'art, or art for art's sake. Art needed no purpose other than its own beauty. All these ideas had different manifestations across different art movements. So, for example, this view was important to the creation of abstract art in the first years of the 20th century. Later on, the geometric compositions of P. 
Pete Mondrian, or the action paintings of Jackson Pollock. Together with their thinking about art, inspired American art critic Clement Greenberg to fortify this approach for analyzing art only through those elements used to create it, considering that abstract art was the truest expression. These days, the formal analysis of an artwork is normally the first step and not the final goal of an artwork analysis, but it is a necessary step since one must first learn to see the artwork and then move on to analyze it. Formalism is also an example of how the same concept can be a means for analyzing art and an intention for creating it. Now is the turn of historical analysis, which examines art in relation to the place and time where it was created. Back to our Monet painting of the bridge. This sort of analysis would explore the social, cultural, economic, and political landscape of late 19th century France, where Monet lived. And it would also dive into his biography and look for any 19th century documents written by Monet or that directly talked about him. Since works of art, as our Monet painting, often survive four centuries, some art historians may also study a work's relevance at later historical moments. For example, they could consider who have been the owners of Monet's 1899 painting and in which art exhibitions it has been shown. Like so many kinds of writing about art, historical analysis was studied by German thinkers during the 19th century. For example, in the 1860s, Jacob Burckhardt wrote the first major studies of art as an aspect of culture in his books about the Italian Renaissance. Another important character was Karl Marx, who during the 19th century thought art should be interpreted mainly through the economic structure and produced it rather by what it looks like. As time has gone by, different thinkers have explored how art and history collide and how even a single work can reveal a great deal about the society that created it or about the intentions of the artist. Nowadays, historical analysis is still relevant, yet it's often joined by other sorts of analysis as the formal one, or at times it's also accompanied by an analysis of how an artwork is interpreted by its viewer, which leads us to the next theory, the reception theory. Reception theory focuses on the perception or interpretation of who is watching the artwork. Back to our Monet painting. This theory would explore the effects, thoughts, and emotions that this painting had on you as the viewer, and when used next to the historical approach, it could also dive into how it was perceived during different time frames. This approach gained traction in the 1960s and came mainly from the literary tradition. It's also sometimes connected to a psychological component encompassing how you as the viewer can complete an artwork with your experience. Okay, we've now covered those approaches to the artwork dealing with its appearance, with how does it relate to the time period where it was produced, and with how do you as the viewer think about it. Yet one more way of approaching an artwork, though, is by analyzing its material qualities or its materiality. This approach pays special attention to the behind-the-scenes process and materials involved in creating an artwork. This is an interdisciplinary approach since it frequently involves art historians working next to conservators and scientists to uncover the process of art making from raw material to finished work, considering also the potential to signify that materials by themselves have. In our Monet bridge painting, this sort of analysis would involve lab tests to explore its pigments and the type of materials used, and would include x-rays to uncover any traces made by the artist before applying color. Last but not least, in the last decades, some theories have targeted once mute characters within art history. For example, gender theory explores the role that gender has in relation to creativity and to the writing of arts stories. This theory followed the worldwide feminist movement in the later 20th century when women also became a renewed topic for art and art history. For our Monet painting, gender theory would ask, for example, how did Monet's gender impact the way in which he gained international recognition over other impressionist female artists of his time that have until recently been recognized, such as Berthe Morisot or Mary Cassatt? Also, critical race art history acknowledges the role that race has played in culture, 
and explores how it impacts how we view and interpret art. More often than not, each art historian or art critic borrows some of the questions from all these methods and creates its own theoretical construct to explore an artwork. At the same time, there are a bunch of different theories out there that are being created or reinterpreted, but for now, let's return to our Monet painting. And it's your time to decide which question do you want to ask it.